Welcome to Know My Faith. My guest uh, today is uh, Dr. Egal German. And uh, Dr. German, thank you. Welcome to the program. Hi, Rob. Shalom, everybody. So I'm, I'm confused now because uh, you're in Chicago, um, you're an Israeli, but you were born in Tashkent in Uzbekistan. So w which are you now? Are you American now? Uh, no, I'm, I'm Israeli. I'm an Israeli citizen. I've been living in different countries. I immigrated to Israel when I was uh, very young. And then I uh, moved to Canada to do my doctoral studies in biblical studies. And then I'm here in Chicago with my family and uh, teaching in different theological institutions. Yeah, because your wife is from Chicago. Yeah. So right now I live here in, in, the, in the city of Chicago. Yeah. Excellent. It's good to have you on. We want to talk a little bit about, uh, I suppose, uh, biblical apologetics, and you've got a you've you've got a, a website for that too, which we'll look at. Um, what we try and do with Know My Faith is we want to encourage Gentile believers to dig a little bit deeper into the Scriptures to discover the um, the historical and cultural context of the scriptures, because, uh, we believe that we miss out on so much by looking at it from a Western mindset. Yes. Yes. And, 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 and that's, that's also on my, uh, on my heart, um, in my, in our ministry, we focus on the historical, cultural, and other aspects of the biblical text. So the biblical text is not some kind of a distant, uh, narrative for us, but it comes a lot to life. So, we are basically doing the same thing. I noticed that you are answering uh, online questions for Dr. Michael Brown. Uh, how did that come about? Oh, yeah. So I got to know Dr. Michael Brown about uh, five years ago uh, through uh, his school, a branch of his school located here in Chicago. Uh, his school is uh, Fire School of Ministry. So I've got uh, a chance to teach there a couple of courses in biblical studies and uh that's how I got to know Dr. Michael Brown. So I'm his Jewish minister assistant, and it's been a great blessing to work with him in the past couple of years. I imagine that there would be an awful lot of uh, tricky questions come in uh, to, to need answering. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's, that's, that's the thing that I really love about this ministry, that I have the chance to interact with people from different backgrounds. You, I'm getting questions from Jews. Uh, from Christians, from Messianic Jewish believers, people involved in different cults, uh, other religions. So it's it's just a great opportunity to reach out to them with the gospel and answer their questions based on God's word. What would be the most common misunderstanding in the questions that you get? And I would say that um, if uh, we look from the Jewish uh, audience, I would say that uh, one of the hardest questions for them is how you can you how you can actually embrace a Jewish Messiah who claims to be God in the flesh. So I would say that it's, it's, it's kind of a stumbling block for the Jewish community throughout the ages. And uh, in recent years, uh, there are even some attacks on the full deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, even from within the Messianic Jewish community. So it's a, a major question that yeah. uh, questions of different perspectives and different backgrounds are tackling at, at, at this time. Do you use the the text in Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah 6, that for unto us a, a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name, and one of the names he shall be called is Almighty God Everlasting Father. To me, uh, I find that as a messianic verse, and you go, well, it's, it's quite straightforward. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Isaiah chapter 9. No, and chapter 9. And it actually belongs to the book of Emmanuel, chapter 7 through 11 of Isaiah, where we find a cluster of prophecies, and there are definitely Messianic prophecies, and even the, and even the rabbis acknowledge that in some of the writings. So Isaiah 9, the, the verse that you quoted, is a real um, uh, direct Messianic prophecy that leaves no questions and no doubts who about the identity of this Messiah, about the fact, the fact that he's God himself, he's Yahweh in the flesh, the God of Israel. Yeah. We get told sometimes that the, the rabbis purposely hide these verses. And I don't, I want, don't want to go slamming uh, Orthodox Jewish rabbis at all. But is it a case of these scriptures being purposely hidden from the people? Or is it the case of that veil 
uh, that Paul talks about still being over their eyes? It's a, it's a very good question, Rob. So uh, specifically with respect to Isaiah chapter 9, I, I wouldn't say that the rabbis are hiding their text from the Jewish community. No, it's not the case. Uh, so I would say that on the one hand, there are misinterpretations of this particular text, just like of many others. For example, applying this to the king Hezekiah, the Judean king. Mm. Uh, but also I would say that just like you said, and Paul speaks about this, yeah, there is a spiritual veil on, on the eyes of many uh, Jewish people in the world. But we do see that there is a revival happening in front of our eyes. So that's a great miracle. Yeah. It's a blessing. And we can actually take part in it in our own um, places where we live and where we can reach out to Jewish people and others with the gospel. I don't want to get too much into uh, eschatology because that would take us uh, far too long. But in my understanding, that, that veil is going to be there until Messiah comes, until he act until they actually call out to him, uh, Baruch HaBa B'Shem Adonai, um, which must make it very difficult for Jewish evangelism. That's, 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 exactly, that's exactly the situation. And um, personally, as a Jewish believer in Yeshua, I see that Jewish evangelism is a very important um, step in our evangelism. But many Christians are not realizing that and are not doing anything to reach out with the gospel in a very sensitive, uh, biblical way to their Jewish neighbors with the gospel. They think, oh, they have their own religion. Yeah, they're Jews. They know God. They have the Bible. But the problem is, first of all, that many Jews are, they, they don't believe in any God. That's number one. Some are very, some are atheistic. And on the other hand, you do have some uh, traditional Jews and their various groups there. But those people, unfortunately, focus mostly on rabbinic literature than on the Hebrew Bible, on the Tanakh itself. Yes. Okay. So we have those challenges and we are, we have to uh, be equipped with good, solid knowledge of God's word, guided by the Holy Spirit and with passion go and declare the good news of the yeah. gospel. That verse I asked you about um, when my wife and I were in uh, Jerusalem about four years ago and uh, met an American Jewish gentleman as we did the City of David tour. We just, you know, we just got on well together and then we bumped into each other again at Ben Gurion as we were leaving. And I, I, I pulled out my phone, my Bible on the phone and I went to that verse in Isaiah and I said, look, you know, you're flying out in half an hour, I'm flying out in an hour, so we're not going to get into an in-depth discussion on this, but... You know, he'd been to Mishnah school, I think it is, in Jerusalem, six months or, you know. So I said, what is your understanding? I said, our understanding as Christians is that this verse is uh, about the Messiah and it calls him everlasting Father, Almighty God. I said, what's your understanding? And he looked at it, he goes, I've never seen that verse. Uh, he said, we studied the Mishnah. We didn't study the Tanakh. And I'm, <laughs> I'm incredulous. Right, right, right. And, and you know what, Rob? I don't think it applies to all Orthodox Jews. I do think there are very serious students of the Bible in the Orthodox, you know, Orthodox and the ultra-Orthodox Jewish communities, right? So we don't need to paint with a broad brush okay. and say okay, they're all like this, right? But, uh, but, uh, but I think it goes back to the rabbinic literature itself. There are some texts in the, in the, in the Gemara and the Babylonian Talmud which actually elevates rabbinic literature above God's word, about even the Tanakh. Yeah. So this tendency exists since uh, post Second Temple period, and it's it's not a, it's it's not a new thing for us. It's not new. It's not new, right? But we have to counter this, right? To counter yeah. this with love, humility, compassion, uh, and yet at the same time speaking the word of God to them and praying for them. It's. I mean, it, you don't have it on your own. You've got many of the cults that elevate their own books above the Bible or you know, the, the Mormons of the Book of Mormon above the Bible. The catechisms believe what the catechism says. So, as you say, it's not, uh, not unique to Judaism. Uh, let me ask the same question I asked you before, but from a different side. What would be one of the most asked questions from Gentile believers that you have to answer? Yeah, so I would say uh, one of the most common questions is this. What do we do with the Old Testament? What do we do with the Mosaic law? What do we do with different regulations that we find uh, in God's word? Does it apply to us or yeah. not? What applies? 
So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty complex question. So it's not like <laughs> yes and no, right? You have to take a specific commandment. You have to take a sp specific biblical verse and analyze it and then see how it applies through the eyes of the New Testament. So that's basically kind of questions that I'm getting. And uh, it's a blessing. And it's at the same time, it um, humbles me to see that people are hungry for the word of God. And I can be used as a modest tool to open up God's word. And the Lord opens up many things for myself throughout this yeah. process. Do you ever get to the point where you go, my goodness, that's the fifth time somebody's asked me that this week? from different people uh, and uh, sometimes the way they articulate their, their questions are a bit different, but the idea is the same, right? And what really, uh, really kind of fascinates me is the fact that uh, it looks like that those people, they go to, to, to their churches and the problem is that on the one hand, their pastors, maybe they're, they're not giving them solid answers, that could be the case, or the other one, uh, there is spiritual a lack of uh, of um, opportunities to discuss deep theological and biblical questions, even in local evangelical communities, even yeah. as well as in the Messianic Jewish communities, right? And I do think that we have actually to counter this and say that we are, as believers, we are all equal in God's eyes. Nobody, is, the, the pastor is not superior or any one of us. We are all mm. disciples of Yeshua, of Jesus, and we all have to sit together, open the Bible, pray, and study God's Word. And, and together we can find answers to our questions. Yeah, yeah. I remember a situation, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty, um, uh, I suppose, academic sort of a guy. I like delving into my books. My wife is, is very different. She has a... Uh, we'll call it a simple and basic faith. She's she's not into in, into the, the academia at all. And I remember sitting down with a, a book on Isaiah, mm -hmm. and uh, and Sharon was doing something else. And I said, I said, it's amazing. This guy reckons there are anything up to seven different people that wrote the book of Isaiah. Mm -hmm. You know, and and Sharon's response was was it was brilliant. She said, What does it matter? If God wanted it in the Bible, doesn't matter if it was one or a hundred people, it's in the Bible. And I thought that's that's so simple. You know, you and I can sit down and we could discuss this, you know, it, it, like the rabbis, we could discuss it in the gate for years and years and years. It's in the Bible. It doesn't matter. You know, that's that's the simple side. Um, I do find, though, that one of the things, and because and, I want to talk about this website of yours, uh, BibleApologist.org, um, I think one of the reasons why we are so loath to go out and talk to people about Jesus, about the Bible, is that we don't actually know the scriptures. You know, we talked about Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses before. They come to our door. They know their scriptures. Mm -hmm. we, mm -hmm. we cringe when that happens because we don't know the scriptures to combat what they're saying. Yeah, Rob, you just described a very typical situation where you have people, missionaries from different religious, uh, specifically those cults that you just mentioned, and they come to your door, they bring to you something, they they're open their Bible, although their Bible is not the Bible that we use, but at the same time, they bring their own message and they're pretty confident in it, right? And here you go, we are believers, we believe that we are born again, we, have, we, we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we know the gospel, and we sometimes don't know what to answer, when we don't know how to reach out to them and to people of other beliefs, right? So that's, that's why I think apologetics is vital for every believer in every local church. Doesn't matter which denomination, Baptist, Pentecostal, Charismatic, Messianic, yeah. right? We have God's word. We call ourselves Christians, Messianic believers, believers, disciples of Yeshua. And we have to know what we believe and we have to know what those people believe and this way we, have, we can have the interaction guided by the Holy Spirit so we can bring the word of truth, of truth to their hearts and minds mm. and the Holy Spirit will open their eyes to see the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. Yes, yeah. And we need to know it from Scripture, not just from I think or I feel. Exactly, exactly. Right, right. So I was yeah. thinking those, those questions that you are answering from different sides, that must help you with, uh, with putting together your apologetics course on uh, BibleApologist.org. 
Yes, exactly. Right, right. So, um, you know, uh, this actually gives you an excellent opportunity to dig deeper into scripture. And at times you have to go and check other sources, like different commentaries, different uh, interpretations, uh, references, dictionaries. And then you are more equipped to write solid articles and prepare materials. And mm -hmm. currently I'm even writing one book in Hebrew. Uh, right, I'm working on a book in Hebrew now for Israel. And uh, this is going to be the first book ever written uh, in Hebrew, unmasking two heresies, two cults in Israel, specifically the JWs and the SDA, the Seventh Advanced. So this is going to be the book that, uh, with God's help, will put into their, uh, into their hands so people can see and know the truth and be delivered from their spiritual darkness and mm. come into the kingdom of the beloved son. Well, you have a little personal experience with the Jehovah's Witnesses from your uh, younger days. Yes, exactly, exactly. So that's uh, kind of a part of my life. <laughs> and uh, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's part of my spiritual journey, I would say, when I was a teenager with my parents. Uh, we became part of the local kingdom hall for a couple of years in Israel, actually, without even knowing the Lord, without knowing the Bible. They taught us with their own books, with the Watchtower and their literature. But unknowingly, we became members of their local so-called kingdom hall. I call mm -hmm. it the, uh, the hall of darkness. <laughs> uh, but uh, but uh, then it took us a couple of years actually to realize that we are in the wrong place and we have to uh, be rescued by the Lord as soon as possible before God's judgment falls upon us. So the Lord was really merciful. Uh, Yeshua delivered us, brought us uh, out from this heretical cult. It, it was a spiritual battle. We, we were uh, actually called uh, apostates, the way they call anyone who is there and leaves the organization. Yeah. And it was really a trauma, a psychological and a spiritual trauma that took us years to heal. But the Lord was really merciful and brought us to a local blessed congregation of believers, a plume of brethren assembly in Israel, where, and, uh, where we uh, accepted the Lord Yeshua and started to minister. So yeah. that was uh, that kind of experience in my life that ignited a very uh, a great interest in apologetics and the, the need to reach out with the gospel to Jews, Muslims, people of different religions. I'm assuming that uh, the the whole experience was instigated by a, a couple of elders knocking on your door. But did your family come out of a, a an atheist agnostic mi um, mindset, or were you Orthodox Jewish at the time? Were you were you believers yeah. in Hashem at the time? So um, we were, I would say, semi traditional, uh, semi uh, seekers. So, for example, we would go to the synagogue once in a while. We would pray from the Jewish book prayer, the Sidur. Yep. Uh, we would celebrate some of the Jewish feasts, but we were, not, we were not really much into it. So some traditions, but there was a real spiritual hunger at this time. But I, I believe that the Lord allowed for me and my parents to, to actually to go for this spiritual experience, which I would never wish to anyone, <laughs> spiritually speaking. But I think that it was necessary because the Lord now can use me in a ways that wouldn't be a, wouldn't be possible if I would never experience that. Yes. So now I know how people feel and what they believe, and I know, okay, okay, those are the things that I experience. I know what the Bible says, and I can always bring them to God's Word, and with God's help, I can answer their questions and pray for them. Yeah. Is the uh, the Bible apologetics is that part of the uh, the Yesod Bible Center? Oh, that's that's a good question, Rob. So uh, Yesod Bible Center is the educational arm of the new apologetics ministry launched last year. So the new apologetics ministry is called the International Biblical Apologetics Association, and our website is bibleapologist.org. Yep. And our website is bilingual. It's Russian and English. And we uh, have their materials, courses. Uh, we are developing our YouTube channels, uh, social media, so we can reach as many people as possible. And anyone who is interested to learn more about it is much is very welcome to uh, visit 
the website and uh, the we other um, social media and YouTube okay. channels and reach out to me. So, so we can do we can do online learning with you through Yasod or through BibleApologist.org. Yeah. So uh, I teach live online Bible courses uh, in English and in Russian. I can also teach in Hebrew. Uh, so all those courses are uh, uh, they're all offered through Yasod Bible Center. Right. So it's an independent website. It's linked to uh, BibleApologist.org. But it's an independent. So I just recently finished teaching a course, Biblical Hebrew 101. So I got a great group of students from different countries, and they really enjoyed it. What does Yesod mean? Oh, yeah. Yesod is a Hebrew word. <laughs> Yesod means foundation. Okay. So foundation. And why foundation? Because many believers lack a solid foundation for faith. And I'm very much thankful the Lord for his teaching in Matthew chapter 7, where Yeshua reminds us, right, that you can build your faith on a solid foundation, on a rock, right? Otherwise, yeah. you have no foundation. So we have always to go back to Scripture. We have to. We are called to be like the Bereans, Acts chapter 17. We have to, to check everything by God's word and see if what we believe and practice actually fits what the Lord tells us and reveals to us in Scripture. And that's and that's the key, isn't it? It's what God tells us in Scripture. And again, going back to it, the, I mean, there is the the uh, prophecy. I cannot remember which prophet it's from, but it says that in the end times there will be a dearth of the Word of God. There'll be a lack of the Word of God. Paul says in Thessalonians that uh, during the tribulation, God will de send deception, and they'll be deceived because they did not love the truth. Of God's word, and and to me that's the you know I, I spoke in a church a while ago, and I won't name the church, but I said I said look open up your Bible to wherever it was, and about three people had their Bibles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's exactly uh, Rob. It's 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 here in here in America, North America, Canada, and the United States. The same the same situation, right? There is a, uh, a the, the tendency of biblical illiteracy is growing every year. And as, as a result of this, people are lacking a biblical worldview. Yeah. And if you don't have a biblical worldview, you cannot share your faith. You cannot defend your faith. You're basically helpless. And the enemy of our souls can actually uh, catch you with, with anything, with any heresy, false doctrine, um, extra biblical practice. And then you're lost. Yeah. Because it sounds right. Right. When, yeah. when, when the enemy comes in with that logic and you go, oh, that sounds right, and because you don't have that depth, that foundation of the word, you're easily deceived. Exactly, exactly, right, right. What would and be the, the number, what, when we're looking at foundations, what would be the number one building block? I mean, obviously Yeshua is, is the cornerstone, but when you're teaching the biblical foundations course, what's your first teaching? What's the first step? Yeah, so I would say that the first step is actually believing and trusting in the Bible as the inerrant Word of God. Because you find some Christians, pastors, and even theologians who are actually doubting that the entire Scripture is God's Word, and God's Word alone, all right? And then you have a variety of different theories out there in, in the so-called Christ, uh, Christian world where Christians are really confused. Oh, do, can I trust the book of John? Oh, wow, it speaks about the whale. It sounds like a childish story. Or then you have some miracles. Then you have the creation in six days, right? And, and, and then in addition to this, Rob, you have even pastors who tell you that you have to unhitch from the Old Testament. Yes. So all of this taken together actually means that believers have no foundation if the Bible is not God's word for them. It's not inspired by the Holy Spirit. So I always start with this. That's the kind of block number one. The statement that the Word of God is the Bible, is the Tanakh, yeah. the, the, the Torah, the prophets and the writings, and the apostolic writings of the New Testament, or in Hebrew, Brit Hadashah. Brit Hadashah. If, we believe, yeah. if we hold to God's Word, we have the foundation. And from there, we can go and actually expound it. Yeah. Uh, we need to know it. We need to read it. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to quicken it to us as that Rima word so that we can wield it as the sword of the Spirit that Paul talks about. 
Um, if we don't know it, we're just, we're, we're floundering, aren't we? We're, we're doing nothing. Exactly, exactly. Ephesians chapter 6, right? We have the full armor of God, right? And then if you're missing one of the most important elements, right? Yeah. The weapon, right? Right? What, 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 what's going to happen to you, right? You're not a soldier anymore. No, that's true. <laughs> you, you, you just, you're just somebody standing there in a fancy uniform. Yeah, right. Let's switch to a different topic, um, and that would be Jewish evangelism, because that is very much one of the reasons why Know My Faith was started, was to give us, us Gentiles, that uh, the Jewish understanding, that cultural historical understanding of the scriptures, so that we can reach out to Jewish people. As you mentioned before, um, so much of Jewish society now, not just in Israel, but around the world, is actually, uh, actually secular. It's not, they're not believing Jews at all. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So sometimes we come with our own uh, presuppositions with respect to Jewish evangelism. Oh, we think, okay, he's a Jew. Okay, so he believes in God. He keeps the commandments. He knows his Torah by heart. But then you realize that this man doesn't know even the word Torah. He never even visit, visited any synagogue. And then you have, and then you come to your senses and you ask yourself, wow, what, how do I reach out to him? What should I say, right? So yeah. I think that every believer has to be well prepared uh, to meet a ver a different kinds of Jewish people and know what are worldview, uh, what are what are their foundations, uh, moral, political, social, ethical, and based on it, he can navigate and reroute the conversation in a way that can actually speak to the heart of that person. Would you say that most Jewish people have an understanding that uh, the Jewish religion involves the Creator God and the Bible, even if they don't believe it, would would they have that understanding? And I would say that most, but not all Jews. Uh, what uh, what's happening in the uh, in the diaspora and the Jewish community, for example, here in, in America? I don't know what's taking place in Australia and New Zealand in, in the Jewish community, but what I see here that more and more Jews are uh, becoming so secular, so liberal, uh, they that I don't even th think that they have even asking themselves spiritual questions anymore. They do identify themselves as Jews in a very cultural, broad yeah. sense. But when you ask them what does your Jewishness mean to you, I don't think you will get a real solid question, even without any religious affiliation. Right, so it's so mostly it's just I, I'm Jewish because my father was Jewish, or, or nowadays my mother was Jewish and her mother was Jewish, and yeah, yeah, right, 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 exactly. Of course, when when you encounter uh, Orthodox Jews or ultra Orthodox Jews or even conservative or Reform, that's a different case because they have some kind of a theological worldview already built in, and then you have to know what they believe and you have to know the Hebrew Bible very well so that you can. <laughs> have a good interaction with them. Yeah, we have a lot of uh, a lot of uh, Israeli travelers come through New Zealand. Well, not at the moment, obviously, with the whole COVID lockdowns. Uh, but most of them are just out of the IDF. They want to get away from Israel as far as possible. So they come and they travel through New Zealand. Uh, and most of those, because they're younger people, I would say would fit into that, that first category of being very, very secular and having mm -hmm. no faith in God, no knowledge of Tanakh or Torah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And that uh, that's actually what happens with those young men, that some of them are even drawn to uh, different uh, Asian religions, you know, like Buddhism, New Age stuff, uh, the Kabbalah, Hinduism. Yeah. And they're drawn to all of this uh, occult, evil, demonic stuff without even knowing that where they're actually heading. So um, here's the mission of every born-again believer uh, who loves the Lord, who loves Israel, is to reach out to them and tell them, guys, you are going in the wrong path and it's time for you to come back to the God of your father, so the God of Israel, Yahweh, and his word that we find in scripture. How do you find that? I mean, obviously you get to talk to uh, to uh, some of these people. How do you find it personally? As, as a, a Jewish, an Israeli Jew, how do you find it speaking to them? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, um, when I lived in Israel, I had various interactions and I was involved in uh, even public evangelism. 
So uh, you find a variety of Jewish people that tell you, okay, I don't know, I'm agnostic, I don't believe in God, or say, yeah, I, I love the Tanakh, I know something from the Tanakh, but I'm not really into, religious, into religion at all. So here you have to keep this kind of a balance and conversation, not to put any pressure on them when you want to explain, when you want to tell them something, but at the same time, uh, be always on the guard and don't let them kind of throughout the conversation and distract it, okay? And I think knowledge of God's word, again, is a key here. For example, messianic prophecies. And I think that uh, the, uh, the importance of knowing messianic prophecy is really vital for uh, reaching any kind of a Jew, okay? For example, you have an Orthodox Jew, right, who say Yeshua, Jesus is not the Messiah of Israel, right? Yeah. And then he would say, uh, he, he's going to tell you, we have war in the world, right? Famine, disease, sickness, and whatever, right? When the Messiah comes, it's all going over, right? Okay, then you have the prophecy, and you can go and, and actually share from Scripture that, yes, the Messiah has already come, but he's coming again, right? Yeah. But when you meet, for example, a, a Jew who is, let's say, a secular Jew, right? He doesn't know the prophecies. He doesn't believe in the Bible. He doesn't believe in God's existence. And then you can use a messianic prophecy as kind of foundation for the conversation and tell them, oh, we have lots of supernatural stuff going on in the Bible. We have predictions. God exists. Prophecies are real. The unseen world is real. So you can use the messianic prophecies as kind of a jump uh, board for, uh, for um, different people and different yeah. audiences. So in some instances, what we're talking there at the end is, is kind of like proof of God's existence because of the prophecies yeah. uh, for, for the, for the secret. I, I have a friend in, um, in Echo, Guy Cohen, who uh, leads a uh, fellowship, Messianic fellowship there. And uh, he came out of the Orthodox world and he says he went to his rabbi, I can't remember how old he was, with the prophecy from Zechariah. Mm -hmm. And he goes, why is Messiah riding a donkey? Mm -hmm. Why isn't he in a helicopter or a limousine? And it, it just dawned on him that Messiah must have come many, many years ago. And that's what led him to find Yeshua. Right. Amen. Amen. Right. So, um, Rob, you know, Zechariah is one of the most explicit and direct Messianic prophecy book that we ever find in the Hebrew Bible. So we have those amazing prophecies like Zechariah 9, the one you just quoted. We have Zechariah 12, Zechariah 14, like whole chunks, chapters. Yeah. And they picked two comings of the Messiah, one Messiah, one person, but we have him coming as a lowly servant of the Lord, and then he's, it's the one who's coming back in the clouds of heaven. So we have this interesting theological dilemma in rabbinic Judaism, right? Yeah. And they have two Messiahs, Mashiach ben David, Messiah the son of David, and Mashiach ben Yosef, Messiah the son of Joseph. But the Hebrew Bible doesn't speak about two Messiahs. It speaks about one Messiah. And this, this comes from the from the, from the mindset. We all, I already have the, pre, the uh, preconceived idea that this is the case. Therefore, I will interpret the scriptures this way um, and, and, and get the wrong answer. Sadly, answers in Genesis and Creation Ministries have um, several. I know Creation Ministries actually have a booklet on this: arguments that creationists shouldn't use. Are mm -hmm. there arguments that? Gentile believers shouldn't use with Orthodox Jewish believers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, yes, yes, I, I think there are arguments uh, which are not, I would say, the strongest arguments. So I think that in every, in, if any person, doesn't matter his background, his faith, his cultural or uh, educational background, you always have to begin with the strongest arguments. Okay, so for example. Beginning with an argument like Deuteronomy chapter 18, right? The Messianic prophecy that the Lord will raise up a pro prophet, prophet like, like yeah. Moses, right? Like him, right? Yeah, okay, it's a prophecy. I do believe it's a Messianic prophecy. It's quoted several times in the New Testament writings. Yeah. But I wouldn't begin with it because it's not the strongest prophecy. It's not the, it's, it's not the most explicit, uh, actually, a precursor to the coming Messiah. I would go, for example, to Isaiah 53. I would go to Zechariah 12, to Daniel chapter 7, Micah chapter 5, and because or Psalm 22, right? We yeah. do have 
uh, very direct Messianic prophecies, Daniel chapter 9, which do speak about the real coming Messiah in a specific time frame, a specific lo- geographical So location. that is believed in the Orthodox, Daniel 9 is believed to be a Messianic prophecy in the Orthodox world? Um, um, again, your question, Rob, if you can... Daniel chapter 9, where it says uh, from the going forth of the, the command to rebuild Jerusalem until coming of, of the prince, is that seen by Orthodox Judaism as a Messianic prophecy? A, a, a good question. So um, I, I wouldn't say that the whole rabbinic Judaism actually regards this as a Messianic prophecy. Uh, some Jewish commentators uh, do see this as a Messianic text, but not all, not all. And they have uh, some interpret as Daniel 9 with respect to the Maccabees, the Maccabean period, 2nd century BC. Right. Uh, but I don't think it's really the case because the text of Daniel chapter 9 in Hebrew speaks about Mashiach Nagid. Mashiach Nagid is a very unique expression that we find in the prophecy of Daniel 9. And uh, taken together, it actually points to a, a real messianic figure who is going to be killed and then something's going to happen to him. He's going to raise up from the dead, although it's not explicitly written there, but the text speaks about about events that would happen post his death. Yes, yeah. Yeah, like he, he will see his children. I mean, this is after he's died. Therefore, he's similar to um, to Abraham, what, uh, what the writer of Hebrews explains to us that Genesis does not, is that the reason why Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac is because he believed that God would raise him back to life. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. so that's already yeah. in there. That, that picture is in there. Uh, just as we come to an end with this podcast, Egal, what would be, um, and again, if you're, if you're watching this or listening to this, um, just check out the, the websites, um, which is uh, bibleapologist.org and the Yesod Bible Center. Is that one word, yesodbiblecenter.org? Yes, that's yeah. correct. Yeah. Okay, so d- just if somebody's only watching this, this is all they're going to watch. What would and, and they're a believer, uh, a Gentile believer in Jesus. What would you want to leave them with? What would you want to say? Yeah, so um, I would love to uh, leave you guys with the words of First Peter. I would like to quote from God's word, First Peter chapter three, verse fifteen. First Peter chapter three, verse fifteen. Let me read the, the following words. But in your hearts are Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So here I see this great command for all of us. We are to be prepared to make a defense. Each one of us called to be a witness of Christ and to defend his word. So let us be ready let us be equipped. Uh, let the Holy Spirit uh, ignite this uh, passion in our hearts that we are the soldiers of the living God, of the Lord of hosts. May the Lord bless you whole. Uh, it's a special time in the Jewish calendar, in the biblical calendar, the high holidays. I would like to wish you all a wonderful and blessed Feast of Trumpets, the blessed remembrance of Yom Kippur, the Death of Atonement, and the celebration of Chag Sukkot, of the Feast of Tabernacles. May the Lord be with you and guide you and protect you from all evil. So thank you, Egal. And again, if you're watching this or listening to this, uh, check in the comments or in, in the in the description for the websites and uh, do your best to know the Word of God because, uh, uh, as Egal, you, you'll agree with me, the, the more you discover these things, it's not just you go, wow, I know much more stuff now. You go, God, you're amazing. Amen. Amen. Exactly. Right. And it uh, makes you even more a humble pe- a person when you realize that you are a vessel in God's hands and you just do your modest mission in, in the work of the kingdom. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob.